In August of 1969, I read the earliest parts of the McNamara study for the first time. Seeing the war from its beginning affected me more than I thought possible. It changed my whole sense of the legitimacy of the war. What I learned was that it was an American war from the start. President Truman financed the French to retake its former colony, even though he knew the French were fighting a national movement that had the support of the people. But the cost of defending freedom, of defending America, must be paid in many forms and in many places. Eisenhower supported a brutal dictator in canceling elections called for by the 1954 Geneva Accords. So we opposed elections while pretending to support democracy. We are attempting to help Vietnam uh, maintain its independence and not fall under the domination of the communists. Kennedy lied to the public and to Congress, saying we would need only advisors, even though his own military experts told him that South Vietnam would be lost without an immediate commitment of American combat units. We still seek no wider war. I now saw that Johnson was continuing a pattern of presidential lying. Each president wanted to avoid the stigma of losing Indochina to communism on his watch. It wasn't that we were on the wrong side. We were the wrong side. It was a crime from the start, carried out by four presidents as revealed in this study. And now a fifth president was doing the same with no end in sight. The hundreds of thousands we were killing was unjustified homicide. And I couldn't see the difference between that and murder. Murder had to be stopped. Henry, you don't have any idea. The only place where you and I disagree at the present time is in regard to the bombing. You're just out of that and think about the space. And I don't give a damn. I don't care. I'm concerned about the civilians because I don't want the world to be mobilized against you and the butcher. I went to a conference to meet people who were using nonviolent resistance in their lives. A friend of mine told me that he had been a Trotskyist, a labor organizer. And I thought, how does one come to be a Trotskyist? He said, oh, it's like anything else. I met a girl. And uh, it, it is the way it is. So I met a girl uh, from India who had been a Gandhian. I heard her saying to someone else at some point, I come from a culture in which we have no concept of enemy. And uh, it seemed to me you could no more do without the concept of enemy than without the concept of zero in arithmetic. I read into his questioning a real wanting to know, and a real wanting to know because he had seen certain things that he didn't like and that he didn't want to have continued in the world. I found myself handing out leaflets in this long vigil line. And at first, I simply felt ridiculous. Uh, I, I felt that uh, you could see the words on my forehead, practically, uh, what am I doing here? And what, what is this about? I knew that if any of my colleagues had ran to the Pentagon were somehow to catch word of my doing this, they would think I had gone mad. Those that impressed me on the importance of being willing to pay a cost yourself were some young men who were going to prison by refusing to cooperate with the draft. One young man, Randy Keeler, was giving a talk. Within that crowd of people, I was introduced to this a uh, fellow from a background that didn't quite fit with the others, <laughs> and that was Dan. And he talked very personally about what had led him to leave Stanford and join the War Resisters League office. If you can imagine a 25-year-old about to go to trial, having been indicted on five counts, each one of which had a maximum sentence of five years, and as he was telling this, he said, yesterday our friend Bob went to jail. And his voice broke a little at this. 
Uh, and then he said, a week ago, David Harris, the husband of Sean Bias, went to prison. And he said, and I'm really happy that I'll be joining them. But I'm not worried because I know that the rest of you will be carrying on. So by this time, everybody was standing and just clapping but, and crying. And I was crying. And I left the auditorium and I found a men's room that was deserted. Sat on the tile floor just sobbing, hysterically crying, for just sobbing for a long time, for over an hour. And I had these various thoughts, but one of the thoughts was the best thing that the best young men of our country can do is go to prison. When I heard you say these words, I'm going to prison, it was as if an ax had split my head. But, <clears throat> but what had really happened was that my life had split in two. And it was my life after those words that I've lived ever since. And eventually, I got up and washed my face, and then, I, and then I think I cried some more, and then I thought, okay, now what can I do to help end this war now that I'm ready to go to prison? <laughs> this trick is called the square circle. Square. One of the things that stood out about Dan was how severe Dan's judgments were about himself. More than most people I had met, it seemed to me he was still, as a relatively recent convert, he was still sort of transfixed by this question, how could I have done what I did? Okay. And slowly, he began filling in the blanks of this thing I had never heard of, the study. Now, I obviously didn't believe in magic potions, but clearly he was referring to something that was so definitive that it was capable of changing your view. Dan was headed toward walking through the door of being a radical, but he would always take half, uh, he would always go halfway. Back at the Rand Corporation, he sought me out. He said he wanted me to brief him on intelligence in Vietnam, it meant U.S. military intelligence. And so I said, okay, have a seat. Vietnamese have ever wanted is self-determination, really. He'd been in Vietnam for a couple of years and had a much more radical view of the war than I did at that point. And I talked to him quite a bit at Rand, and I liked him. He's a very likable person, very forthcoming, very funny, very, very smart. He had sort of given up all his old cohorts at the Rand Corporation and was hanging out with me. He was in my office every day then we'd go out to dinner, and we'd double date, and people were buzzing about it because he had been one of the top dogs. He did reports that ultimately got him fired uh, about torture and various other reports that they didn't like. After he left Rand, he talked about lies in the studies he had done, lying that had gone on. I said I knew of a study, I'd been reading a study that revealed very high-level lying. I said, Dan, you should leak that to the press. Keeping silent in public about what I had read and heard made me an accomplice. It was not only they who had kept all these decisions quiet, hidden from the American public. I had kept them quiet. My motive.